Hello everyone. Welcome to AIPT USA, the American Institute of Physical Therapy. The reason why we are here today is to make professional and profound videos that can influence the clinician to understand the assessment methods and also treatment techniques region by region. I have made this video into two parts where you'll be seeing the two most common methods which we will be using commonly to evaluate any patient that walks into your door. The first one is based on the concordant sign which Maitland designed. It involves clinical reasoning process and step-by-step -step manner to evaluate a patient. It involves an organized thought process which will aid and help you in understanding where the problems are. The whole process of this evaluation revolves around identifying the concordant sign, which means the pain or the problem the patient came to you for. It goes in a step-by-step -step manner to kind of give you consistency and do a better job. The second part of the evaluation is SFMA, which is Selective Functional Movement Assessment. This was designed by Gray Cook and colleagues, so all kudos to them. So all this information which I'm going to share today about SFMA is credited to them. So going to the first part of the video, it's broken down into several parts. I don't know if you can see the wordings in here, but eventually you'll get to see them at some point so you know what I'm talking about. So the first part when a patient walks into the door in this evaluation is going to include a triage or finding red flags. So you don't want to go through the full assessment if you see a patient comes with severe trauma or if there's any signs of cancer, any clinical condition which you should not be treating. So I'm not going to stress on that part which you already should know to have how to identify red flags. But if you have questions regarding red flags, put a comment under the video so I can make another video regarding that. So going or moving forward into the assessment. The first part of assessment involves postural analysis. So let's talk about posture. So let me introduce you to Daniel, who's going to be our model, and we will identify how are we going to assess posture. So the posture assessment, you can do it any form, but I prefer to do it from the front view first. So what do I see? Does posture tell me everything? No, it only gives me cues to where to look. So I just want to keep this in the back of my mind to figure out what am I looking, what looks abnormal, because nobody's perfect. So you have to see what looks odd. Where would the clinical picture fit into this posture? So. In this analysis, what you can see, she has a little bit of internal rotation on the right side, more than the left side, the way she's pointing her hand. The depression on the shoulder, this almost looks even, but the right shoulder is a little bit down compared to the left one. And I'm assuming that's her dominant side. That's very normal. You can look for cues where they're a little turn or not. And you can see the pelvic height. When you see, okay, it looks pretty normal for her. And how does the kneecaps, they should be facing forward but you can see her kneecaps are pointing inward more on the right side than the left. Her problems will usually be more on the right side compared to the left. Something to keep in mind. How is her foot position? Is she able to point this straight or is she turning out? So that's something to keep in mind from the front of you. I'm also going to be looking at the creases and the folds here. Is she shifted to one side more than the other? Is her cervical spine shifted more? As you can see in her, a little bit shift to the left is what I can see. So those are the things you want to keep in mind. So I would like you to turn and face that way. So now you're looking from the side. When you look from the side, the same things are you going to observe. Where is her ear compared to her shoulder? Is it way too far forward or in line? But again, as I said, this is only a cue. I'm going to go down and see is her elbow bent or straight. If it's too bent, then it means something to me. Is it too turned? Where is her thumb or fingers pointing? I'm going to look, how, is she bent too much in her knee or is she straight? Is the foot turned out or the weight shift is in the center? Is it too forward, forward or back? So just another cue. So if you could face the wall on that side. So the view from the back, what are you looking? What about the glutes? Is it flat or is there a definition to it? Is there too much curvature? That's something you can also see from the side view. But from here, what are we going to see? Again, how's her scapula looking? Does it look very abnormal, almost the same height? As you can see, it's not too bad. Is there a little bit of 
increased folding or hinging or creasing at one of the sides, those are the things you want to observe in posture. Posture is a very static image, so that does not give you all the information. Most of the information can be captured with movement analysis, which we'll be talking next. With regards to movement analysis, this is very important because static image does not tell you a whole lot about how they are moving or how they are controlling the movement. It's all about the control you have over the movement, not just the range of motion. And active movements kind of give you an information, piece of information that you can keep in mind for your assessment. And this could be your concordant sign. The patient might have come with pain when she bends forward or bends back. So if you're able to identify and are able to provoke the same symptoms that the patient came to you for, that will be your concordant sign. So that when you treat and retest, that's what you're trying or aiming to make a change. So let me show you, give you a little bit of an idea how the movement analysis looks like. This could be your back patient, your shoulder patient, anybody. It could be specific to the region you're evaluating. So I'm gonna give you a brief introduction what you should be looking for. So when I ask her to go forward and touch your toes, so I could be looking, okay, is she smooth? Is she able to go all the way down? Is she bending her knees? Are her hips internally rotating? Are she able to touch the toes at all? And is she able to come back up smooth? Is she hinging in spots? So this is the piece of information if you're evaluating it back. And I might ask her to bend back. So where she would bend back, is she able to control that motion? Do you feel like I need to support her? Or if I ask her to come back, is she hinging to come back? So those are all the things you should look for in a movement analysis. That's what tells you how capable he or she is to control movement patterns. Then I could, if I'm evaluating cervical spine, I might say, turn your head all the way to the right. Is she able to have at least about 65 degrees of rotation or more? Is she able to turn the same to the left side? Is she compensating or is she struggling? If she's not able to complete the range of motion, all the things will give you a good piece of input. This is something we all should know. We already done active range of motion, all patients, so we understand this well. But this is important piece. But let's say if she's able to look up and says, oh, that's where my pain is. That's why I came here for it. That's where it hurts when I move this. That is, so cervical extension will be her concordant sign in motion testing with active. So that gives you an idea. Let's say she came to a shoulder problem. I can say, okay, raise your right arm up. We assume that's her problem area out of the right shoulder. I say, raise your arm up all the way. And she says, yes, that hurts when I go up all the way. That would be her concordant sign positive, which I will be evaluating further to see what causes, what tissue causes, or the joint, whatever it is, is just piece of information for active testing. I want to stress another point. If it's an athlete who's like, oh, it doesn't hurt when I go up, but sometimes it does. So what are we going to do? We're going to do some overpressure for active motion. So let's say I say, turn your head to the right. It's not hurting now. Do we stop at that point? We want to clear that spine. So how do we do it? We can do overpressure. So when I stress the passive structures to the end range of motion and says, still it doesn't hurt, I can safely say we can clear that direction of motion. But that's one way to provocate or provoke symptoms where they're having. If we can clear with overpressure, that gives you a better chance to say that, okay, that's not a problem. Let's say if we go and back and try to touch your toes again, so they say it hurt, but it's not hurting now. So I'm gonna apply a little overpressure in flexion direction. So with regards to overpressure, let's say if the patient is able to go down and sometimes it hurts when I bend, then they say, I don't have pain right now. The best way to make sure that's not the tissues that are hurting, I can apply some overpressure, let's say. Does it hurt? Yes. So that kind of tells you, kind of keeps a clue. So when they are put under stress, that tissue is irritable to cause pain. So something to take notice and add to your evaluation. So going back to passive movements, passive movements are nothing but where you're moving the joints in the same range of motion, you're taking the active contraction of the muscles off of the picture and testing if the soft tissue or the connective tissue is responsible for pain, provocation or symptoms. So that way you can rule in or rule out soft tissue involvement. I'm not gonna go through the whole passive, I'm just giving you an idea. So where, let's say she complained of pain in her shoulder. So I am going to raise that up and say, if there's any pain, I could also do over pressure with passive range of motion where she's not actively moving, but I am. 
But if she says there's pain with passive testing, I'm going to evaluate more on the connective tissue rather than muscular contraction or motor control. Now going back to the next testing, that will be your accessory movements. So we'll move forward to accessory movements. Pause. With regards to accessory movements, Maitland definitely made a good impression of helping us understand what's the CPA and the UPA. Let me elaborate a little. CPA is nothing but a central PA motion, especially if you're testing the accessory movements of the spine, this is one way. So you're doing the central spinous process, you're pushing from posterior to anterior. So UPA is unilateral, PA is posterior to anterior. So if she came to me with cervical pain problem, I might test the thoracic and the lumbar too to look for the concordant sign. So if you can provocate, if you can provoke her symptoms with your accessory movement testing, you've done a good job to identifying which segment is probably causing the problem. And of course, that is not the end of treatment, but it is to find out where to focus for your evaluation. So let me show you what a CPA looks like. I can use my thumbs and push on the spinous process a gentle pressure where you can see some blanching of my thumbs, not too hard, very gently. I'm gonna push down and ask the patient, does it hurt? No. I'm gonna keep going down, does it hurt? You're gonna keep going down all the areas you wanna evaluate. Let's say if you get to a segment and says, okay, I'm here, and I push down, and she says, yes, it hurts a little. So that kind of gives me an idea. This is the area I should focus on. And the same way you can do UPA, which is unilateral or one size. So it could be on one side where you're going that way. I also used my pussy palm grip, but the grips is not the point. That's what you're testing. So I can do unilateral say, oh, that's what hurts. But hurt doesn't mean that's a problem. If she says, yes, that is similar to the pain that I am coming to you for, or that is what is what bothers me, that's your concordant sign positive. So that gives me an idea. That's the area I should be treating first before I treat the whole body later. So that's where we pause and I'll show you one more thing about repeated movements and how important it is and how many times clinicians completely forget or do not test this component, especially in the younger athletes or younger population. This is very important. So the most important thing, as I mentioned, the clinicians typically miss is repeated movements and why that is important, because fatigability is an important factor. Let's say if you are a player playing sports, you're running, you're jumping, you're throwing. There are different components. If when you're testing and say the active range of motion is good, the passive range of motion is good, I have performed MMT, they have good strength, but one key factor which most of the clinicians miss is repeated movements and testing for fatigability. What does that mean? So let's say here Danielle can raise her arm straight up. She's got full range of motion, no problem. But if I say keep doing that several times, at least for 30 seconds or more. So let's say keep going, keep doing that continuously. What I'm looking for here, is she able to maintain this continuously for a long period of time? What if you're a tennis player? What if you're a baseball player? Or if you're a cricket player? You have to throw the ball many times. It's not just one time and done. So this is what science tells us. The evidence says people tend to fatigue after a while and they start incorporating poor movement patterns. That's where the performance suffers. Or the patients can do one task several times, they have to reach up after five or eight times, they start to adapt poor patterns. We would have missed that, which means they're getting fatigued quickly. So it's something to look for to improve our plan for treatment. So let's say the other thing, I ask her to go touch her toes. She goes smoothly down, She's come up there, she's like, no pain, and ask her to do it many times. Repeat that, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then, like after, let's see how she does it. And she able to maintain the same speed, same pattern. As you can see, she's slowing down. She's not maintaining the same speed. She's cutting down on the motion. She's not going farther she was. So now I know that movement pattern looks terrible now after eight or seven times. So that's something to keep in mind. Can't do it just one time and say it's all good. We need to do repeated movements to test for fatigability. Very important component. So moving forward, the next thing we need to focus on in this evaluation is sense. What does sense mean? It means severity 
So when I say severity, how severe her pain is on a scale of 1 to 10. If she comes to me with a pain of 4, I'm going to treat her or assess her differently. If she comes to me with a pain of 9, I'm going to treat her differently. So you got to keep that in mind. What is her severity? And also when it comes to sin, you also have to identify what irritability means. How irritable is this patient? Can I touch her? Is she screaming? Or even I push her hard, she doesn't care. So you treat them differently and assess them differently because your results are going to be different. And what you get as objective measures are going to be different. So you have to pay attention to irritability. And what's their nature? Are they psychologically stable? Are they fearful of movement? And what are your perceptions of them? What is their ethical background? What is their state of mind or what is their cultural background they're all matter when you're assessing so that's your nature and also the stage are they in the primary stage of healing or is it a chronic condition or it's been there for a long time even that matters so the last one but not the least is your state state at this point where what i think is best for them so is it in a stable state or an unstable state for me to do a treatment or an assessment so since it's just an acronym to remember these parts of severity, irritability, nature, stage, and state. So keep that in the back of your mind when you're evaluating a patient because the outcomes and your assessment are going to be completely different. So with this, we complete our first part of evaluating a patient. So once this is covered, I'm going to focus on the next part, which is the SFMA. I'm going to describe not in full detail, but we'll give you a good idea what that means or entails, as that is a very interesting form of assessment of the whole body.